So thanks everyone for coming. Welcome to um, the session which is run by us. We are Creative Industries Research and Innovation Network. My name is James Kentridge. I'm um, one of the network leads, currently number two, uh, and a chair. And we're, we're reorganising things at the moment. We also have an excellent research fellow, Maya, who's um, over here. And the session today is about, as you may have guessed, about funding in the creative industry. So not just about research funding per se, but also about thinking about funding for the whole sector more broadly. Because we know that lots of researchers in this area are working um, not just on sort of discrete research grants, but working with partners in, in, in the industry themselves. So the idea of today is to sort of get some ideas on, on um, sort of map the uh, sector as it currently stands, think about future directions. Um, we hopefully have two contributors. We certainly have one at the moment, Josh. I should introduce Josh. Josh Heeple is from the uh, ASOT's Policy and Evidence Centre for Creative Industries, which is based at the University of Suffolk. He's also uh, published very widely on the creative industries and an expert on creative clusters, I believe. Is that right, Josh? Josh is wrong. He's very odd on time. I'm standing on the way. I'll get that one. Um, right, so we have uh, an hour. I guess some more people may join as we get going. Hopefully, uh, our second contributor, who is Lara Kamona from Creative UK, is on the way. Mm -hmm. We hope. Yeah. Um, I should point out we did have a couple of other contributors lined up. We've had to sadly drop out at the last minute. Um, Helen Ryan Wallace, Lots Lab, Central Apologies, and also Trevor McFarlane from Creative Common, Commons, who was going to be here, so he's not able to be here anymore. But we have uh, hopefully two excellent speakers. Oh, there she is. Hi, Lara. Hi, Lara. It's great to have you. Um, so now you're here, I'll introduce you properly. This is Lara Kimona from Creative UK, who are the leading policy advisors um, uh, in the creative sector in the UK. Lara is Director of Policy and Engagement. Is that correct? That's correct, yeah. Um, I checked. Um, okay, and yeah, I think we asked both our contributors to to prepare a brief five minute um, explanation of who they are, brief introduction to what you do and how you do it. So, um, I guess let's start with with Josh, if that's okay, mm -hmm. just to give uh, Lara a bit more time to settle in. So, yeah, I'll hand it over to to Josh. Um, so yeah, we asked you to think about uh, what are the key considerations for in the search for funding from your perspective, Josh, as someone who's both an academic and I guess someone who drives uh, information, knowledge transfer and all those all those elements. Sure, absolutely. Well, um, again, uh, uh, thanks very much for uh, inviting me to, um, to this event and um, it seems very interesting. I wish I could be there in person, but um things being what they are, it's, uh, it's all right. Uh, so um, yeah, so um, my name is Josh Seipel. I'm um, based at the Science Policy Research Unit at the University of Sussex Business School. And for the past five years, I've been working with the AHRC Creative Industries Policy and Evidence Center, where I lead their work on um, creative clusters, um, R&D and innovation and access to finance. So I kind of, my work is sort of across all of those areas. Um, what I'm gonna be talking about it just kind of in my kind of introduction today is to be, highlighting a couple of areas that are um, relevant in terms of some of the research that we're doing and some of kind of the key themes that we are interested in from sort of our research perspective, and then give a couple of thoughts about where we stand and where some of the horizons are in terms of um, collaboration and funding. Um, so in the first instance, I mean, one of the things that we're very interested in in the, in, in, in the, the creative tech overall is the role of space and of clusters. And this is something which is which is a really um, crucial area. And obviously, I mean, I think, you know, you, you will have already seen from from your today, from your um, se previous sessions today. There's a lot of interesting things that are going on uh, at, about the role of universities in these spaces, particularly, though, when we talk about um, the creative um, uh, creative clusters and things like this, there have been a number of sort of key areas of movement around there. The first and sort of most prominent of those was the Creative Industries Clusters Program, which um, and came to the end of its kind of five-year funding cycle um, earlier this past year. And there's going to be another round of funding uh, coming up through that a bit later on. And that's not something I'm directly involved in, but something I'm interested in, because that is an indication by government that they are prepared to invest in university industry collaborations to drive R&D in creative industries. And this is really important in the context of uh, 
of the creative industries more broadly, because when we talk about create when we talk about innovation in the creative industries, it's not necessarily e as easily measurable as you would see in a lot of other sort of high tech sectors. So even though creative industries is very high tech, if you're talking about what innovation looks like and how it's measured in, say, biotech, something that's obviously um, a thing over in Oxford, um, you know, it, it's very easy to sort of come up with metrics on that. You've got patents, you've got, you know, R&D spend that's sort of very clear. You've got, you know, people with PhDs, you've got all these metrics. That's not really something that is as common in the creative industries where you've got lots of freelancers, you have work of R&D may involve people who are freelancers or who are spending a fraction of their time working on a new project and it may be a particular project is innovative so there's a lot of issues there around measurement which is really important and one of the things that we have found in some of the, our research for the creative pack is that this creates a an issue when we talk about access to and provision of finance to creative uh businesses is that innovative creative businesses uh don't necessarily find innovation to be as strong a signal to investors than someone else. If you're to talk about a biotech company or a you know a clean tech company or someone like that, and that they can say, look at all of our patents, look at all of the great high tech things that we have going on for us. A company that might be perhaps even more innovative than that particular hypothetical biotech company in the creative space wouldn't be able to have the same tangible things to be pointing at to be saying look at how innovative and cool and, and and valuable this is to investors and so this act this then creates a lot of issues around the funding ecosystem that is available uh because it means that um that entrepreneurs may end up feeling discouraged so they say actually we're not going to actually bother applying for growth finance at all they may um not really have their innovativeness being picked up by mainstream financial institutions um, and they may not, and it may not even be picked up in the context of um, of uh, funders like VC and things like this as well. And this is something where there are a lot of opportunities. And this is something that um, I'm sure Laura will be able to to speak about quite well. Is where there's there's opportunities for new funding instruments, new ways of operating, and new ways of funding that can support the creative industries in various ways as well. And so I think this is one of the key sort of themes that we have been working on. The other thing I'll just very briefly mention as well, which has been one of our sort of ongoing themes about access, about, um, access to finance, is in the context of the, 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 the spatial and with the cluster story, one of the pieces of work that we did um, a couple of years ago, which has been, I think, quite, quite interesting and I think quite important, is we started looking beyond the idea of creative clusters, you know, the big cities, the Londons, the Manchesters, the, the Bristols, the Brightons. We did some work on creative microclusters, so smaller areas, smaller towns, neighborhoods, rather than big cities. And in that research, we found that outside of the largest established creative clusters, we found that companies that were in micro clusters, but not in the big well-known clusters. They wanted to grow more, but they also reported being more likely to be financially constrained. So there's an interesting story here about regional, regional questions, access to finance outside of the largest established creative clusters. And this is a really important issue because as we have found, these companies were really wanting to grow before the pandemic. Our most recent work suggests the same companies now are the ones were tamping back their growth ambitions, and they're the ones who are actually trying to shrink. And so they were wanting to grow, they're financially constrained, now they're pulling back. And so this create this is a really important policy issue then in terms of thinking about how we can actually support these businesses and coming back to the sort of the beginning and the point around um, universities as well, there's a question of what's the role for universities and particularly universities that are, are outward facing and engaging with their local business environment what they can do to support these businesses, whether it's through general business support or through sector-specific engagement and collaboration. So um, I've got loads of other stuff I could say, but I'll, I think I'll probably stop it there and uh, leave it for the, the questions and the discussion afterwards. That's really useful. Thank you. Thanks, Josh. That's incredibly useful stuff. So um, let's hand over to Lara now and hear what... Um, what, what are the key considerations from Creative UK's point of view for the, the funding sector for arts, arts and humanities and universities and all those elements? From my person, so I'm Lara Carmona. I'm the Director of Policy and Engagement at Creative UK. 
Creative UK, I will give some background because we're getting ready to do a better job of communicating about who we are and what we're up to. But we are um, the relatively recent merger of three separate or, or organizational activities. One is programmatic delivery of quite significant structures of support, including lots of business support development for small creative enterprises and businesses who are looking to grow, who are in early stage. That's where a deep amount of Creative UK's expertise lives. So we are mostly non-London based and have about 120 people scattered across the UK doing that work. There's also loads of specific um, delivery that we do that is programmatic in nature, like production services for TV and film, stuff like that, things that are part of our legacy. Um, the second strand of what we do is policy research and advocacy, um, which sits within my wheelhouse and is my brief. I'm new to the organization, so I've been here five months and I've been waiting to meet Josh. So it's a delight to meet you virtually, Josh, in this conversation. Um, but we do share a very strong interest and in overlap in access to fin finance and the investment ecosystem at large. Um, but the policy research and advocacy bit draws significantly on our memberships. We have a membership structure for that work, which is hundreds and hundreds of organizations, which includes um, trade and representative bodies from pretty much across the creative economy, as well as individual organizations, ranging from significant flagship cultural institutions like the Royal Opera House and National Theatre and the BBC, right the way through to multinationals like Google and TikTok. So the creative economy at large is very broad. Um, and I think it's important to to remember that while there are um, vast differences in all of the subsectors, as they refer to themselves, that there are a range of cross cutting issues which are relevant for everyone. And access to finance is a really good example of that. The third thing that Creative UK does is it runs a VC fund, which is quite unusual, I think. And we um, we developed that approach organizationally over a decade ago in response to market failure in specific relationship to access to finance. So that is also a part of our legacy and our practice. And we are in the middle of recapitalizing that fund at the moment to relaunch at the end of the month, which is very exciting. So we are expanding our direct provision of support for creative businesses in a variety of um, different parts of, of the cultural sector and creative industry. So when it comes to thinking about so I, I kind of approached the question a little bit differently, as you would expect, and I'm definitely not an academic by background. Um, I'm a, a policy influencer um, who, who has cut my teeth over the last two and a half decades in the UK working on a variety of public policy areas. Um, and I'm also a movement builder by background. So one of my specialties is bringing together very large disparate groups to coalesce around very specific um, initiatives in terms of driving change within systems. So with that in mind, there were three things that really like I, I wanted to bring to the fore in terms of contextual considerations that I think really matter. Um, these are going to come at you fresh from the perspective of someone whose background is not the cultural sector and creative industries or cultural and creative industries or creative industries, including cultural sector, depending on who you ask and how that definition is understood. So my three key reflections are that I think... Um, while one can't say that the pandemic is over, so I'm very careful about that language because I just spent six years in health um, working for the nurses of the UK. Um, in this quote unquote post pandemic leveling off where we do see some very radical growth in some specific parts of the creative economy, that growth and activity is not consistent. So the impact of what happened both pre and post pandemic is very different depending on which bits you look at. So film and TV now are having a very different experience than for example, museums. And I think that's important to keep in mind. Um, and some of the extent to which we understand what has happened in hard and soft terms across people and economic value and activity isn't quite clear yet in terms of what, what happened to us um, in that intensive pandemic period. The second thing um, which Josh has already mentioned is around the opportunities for new funding instruments and approaches um, ac across the what I'm referring to is the cultural sector and creative industries, because I think some people demarcate those things, including the UK government in terms of how it thinks about these issues and the implications of that. I, I, th I can't express enough, I think, are really quite significant, um, which links straight to my third point, which is that there is total porousness of people, ideas, tools, and content um, across the sort of creative economy at large. And I think it's incredibly important to remember that. So sometimes we tend to build um, institutional or state um, levers for change in ways that are much more rigid and narrow than, than the way the ecosystem actually operates in practice. So a really good example of that is the freelancing community, 
where you have people whose whose skill sets and disciplines within culture and creative industries are totally portable and they're working across multiple environments in ways that the system the system at large simply doesn't recognize at all either in terms of the capturing of that activity or truly understand standing it um, and thinking about things in a much more holistic way so I, I think a key consideration is um, you know, whether or not one works in a museum or one works in the theater or one works, you know, for a gaming company, the truth is there are things that we need to do across the entirety of the community that enable everyone. And then there are some specific factors within that of, that, of course, need to be attenuated to and responded to that are unique for a specific part of the community. So I hope my language is clear. I'm I'm clear also that as a newbie professional in this space, um, I'm coming with language and sort of nomenclature that's probably quite different. So if there's anything that I'm sharing here, just by way of those top line considerations, I'd be happy to clarify further. But I'm really glad to be here today. And it's really nice to meet you, even though we're not together in person. Yeah, I hope that's a bit of a useful introduction. And um, so whistle stop to sort of the some of the three key things that are on my mind in relationship to this debate. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Um, yeah, so we, we have plenty of time left to discuss with the room. I, I do have lots of questions myself, which I, and I'm going to jump in uh, to get us going. Um, you both mentioned, well, Laura in particular mentioned the problems of definition, I guess, when we're talking about the creative and cultural industries and that people have a sort of set list of, of what is included and what is not included. There's this kind of false division between creative industries and cultural industries. Um, how come, um, how is how is that how is that viewed by Creative UK and, and by the policy by the policy um, sorry the, the PEC the Policy and Evidence Centre and do how how do you how do you draw those how do you draw those uh, guide those guidelines those definitions yourselves are you, are you are you deliberately broad do you like to, do you like to focus in on things how does how does that work. Um, I guess, Laura, do you want to speak to that first? Oh, man, I thought Josh was going to jump in first. Okay. I mean, so, uh, listen, you get very different answers to this question, depending on who you ask. I mean, if I, Josh will have to correct me if I'm wrong or any other subject matter expert in the room. But my understanding is that the broad definition of creative industries for the UK at large, that conversation began in the 90s, you know, and, and did happened around the time that we created the conditions for cool Britannia to occur. So there was a coalescing of a number of specific disciplines and practices at a very particular point in our political history, which created the definition that is largely understood to be creative industries at large. That does include the cultural sector. But the reason why I make that distinction in terms of the fact that I can see there being a distinction between the two is to take one example, just looking at the UK government, you see that play out in the way teams and systems are structured inside the government itself. So the notion that sort of those which are publicly subsidized live in sort of one bit of the camp, as it were, and those which are not live in another. I mean, this is a, a hugely basic distinction that I'm making here, and I would really value Josh's view on that. But in terms of Creative UK, you know, to some degree, we're defined um, by virtue of our membership, and our membership includes the entirety of that broad church. And beyond that, as I said, it is very clear to me as sort of fresh professional on the block that, like I said, people, content, ideas, and tools are totally porous. So it's a bit like I'm trying to make a comparison that might be useful. Often, you know, I spent a long time working in the health sector. Um, there, there's a, there was a, a, a phrasing that I think might be quite helpful here. Sometimes a diagnosis is only as useful as what it allows you to access. So there is something about the way we label and add identities to things or define things that, it, you know, I'm not saying it's not helpful to be called one or the other. What I'm saying is, is are those ways of naming and thinking about things useful? Are they getting the community at large what they need? And talking to the various disparate groups, I cannot say hand on heart that that's the case. And you see that play out mostly in the access to finance conversation, where we have issues right the way across from those who have been publicly subsidized historically across the UK and are seeing diminishing returns in terms of what's available to them right the way through to those who don't sit in one camp specifically and still cannot get commercial investment for a variety of reasons. So what I'm mostly asking is how useful is that distinction? And like, if it's still useful to us, great, let's keep it. But from Creative UK's perspective, we're more looking at, like I said, what, what issues cut across the entirety of that community and what interventions are going to be most useful to drive the growth and support of the widest possible group of people. I hope that's sort of a, a useful bit. I'd love to hear Josh's views. Right, thanks, Laurie. Yeah, Josh, do you want to speak to that? Yeah, so, um, I mean, as you kind of indicate, and, and as, as Laura says, I mean, the question of measurement is a 
is a vexed one and has been for a long time. So using the the technical remit that that say you know the the UK government has a very clear definition of what the creative industries is okay so that it says there's nine creative subsectors and now now that now that the heat is on I probably can't name them uh in rapid time I'd probably forget something and get in trouble so there are nine of them um and they include the, but they include your big hitters uh you know you know film and television and music and performing arts and publishing and architecture and advertising I'm not, not going to say them all because then I'll forget one but and so technically, from from the, the where, from the government's perspective, that is the creative industries. And as Laura says, there's also kind of this other sort of subset of that, which is the cultural industry, which which is sort of the, the cultural industries, which kind of dovetails a little bit into areas like sort of um, heritage and tourism and stuff like that. And it gets complicated and, and, and stuff like this. So with all of that said, one of the things which I'm very interested in and I'm very aware of is that measurement is high m measurement in general is imperfect for everything. Measuring the creative industries and this area of what we talk about in this space is really, really difficult to measure. And one of the, and, and I, I mean I could I could talk for a whole hour just about that and bore everyone's pants off. But you know, the 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 the, the top line thing is that creative activities run much, much more broadly through the economy than the classic DCMS definition of creative industries. And if you don't tick one of sort of the, I don't know, 24 four-digit industry, standard, standard industry classification codes that were originally identified in 2007 and haven't been properly updated ever since, which is a different story, um, if you, if you don't actually tick specifically one of those boxes, then you're not in the creative industries. But at the same time, we know that the creativity and creative activities runs very deeply throughout a lot of different bits of the economy. And a lot of that stuff doesn't show up in the official statistics. And, you know, so there's there's things like, you know, I've spent a lot of time talking to companies like, you know, digital agencies, and they say, we don't even know what industry we're in because it's a new industry, you know, it's a new industry, a digital agency. It's not exactly marketing, not exactly digital, not exactly software, not exactly content, but they're sort of all of the above. And so they tend to end up often in the industry classifications, which is the other random, because we don't actually know what else to call ourselves. And so one of the things which is which is a challenge for us in measuring this is to use the definitions that are ahead of us so that we can speak to government in an intelligent way that's robust, but at the same time, trying to come up with new flexible ways of identifying and counting and observing things that allows us to actually pick up where there's new frontiers and new horizons and things like this. So we've done a lot of work using things like scraped web data, which allows us to pick content off companies' websites because you know there's not there's not you know the the government doesn't have a good way to pick up use of AI, right? We don't know what companies are doing AI because it doesn't show up in any official government things, anything that's publicly available. But if you've got a company that's using AI and they say they're doing it on their website, that might be a better indication that they're doing AI stuff. And so that's the type of thing that we've been experimenting with, trying to improve our measurement in that space. But again, I could talk for hours about this, but I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I guess we should see if anyone in the room has any questions at this point. So I actually work in AI, I'm a computer scientist. And it seems to me that your, your query is mostly about um, finding matching keywords with a particular um, preconcepts uh, formula of what an industry should describe. And um, that often leads to this, this issue of what do you do with those which you have no predefined conditions. Um, it sort of occurs to me that um, in a way, this is not a, a pursuit that will ever will give you a successful answer because um, there's a recursive nature to these things. So people will start to find those keywords that match a particular outcome and will target those specifically and thereby watering down the particular meaning of those. So would it be better to actually say something along the lines of, well, we feel that we should be part of this new category and thereby occupying the niche that encompassing uh, a set of properties uh, instead of uh, relying on this keyword search. 
and forgive me if I if I misunderstand. I, th I think the question was kind of about, I mean, using the example of sort of using scraped web data and uh, kind of saying, well, you know, if if we start sort of counting things through scraped web data, um, you know, does this not mean that it, it creates a possibility for people moving the goalposts and saying, well, if everyone's talking about AI, if we talk about AI on our website, then maybe that will open up new pots of money for us because we're joining the bandwagon and and, and it creates these sort of measurement issues. And I mean, I think this is a really good point. I mean, I, you know, I, we, we've spent a lot of time thinking about how far we can go down those, down that road and how robust those, you know, measures using, for instance, scraped web data are. I think my, my view on it is, is I think it's a good complement to other types of analysis. Um, it's a complement to what the what we typically do for businesses when they register, which is we ask ask companies to say, what do you do? You have to put down, you know, choose from a list of four digit standard industry classification codes, and you have to put down one or two or three or four to say what you do. And that's how the government knows, generally speaking, what you do. Um, and that's, you know, and so I, I mean, I think what I would say is, I mean, you know, part part and parcel of being interested in measurement in this space is being very aware that there's pros and cons of measurement in various ways and being being cautious about saying this one way is the best way forward when we talk when we use great web data we always say look this is experimental stuff right we are not replicating official statistics the ons is not this isn't the same as office of national Dis statistics we're trying something new we'll see what happens you know and i think that's kind of the way that we have to deal with that can I ask a follow-up question then? Um, from Josh, sorry. Um, the common occurrence, uh, certainly in my area, is specifically to do with uh, the point that you made that new developments are not properly defined and don't fit in particular categories, etc. And one of, um, of the possible solutions is to drive that narrative towards the new industry, to the new um, developments uh, by um, expressing those different approaches in a way that uh, makes them distinct from the classifications and thereby allowing possible new classifications to emerge. Is that something that you think might be feasible in this industry? I mean, I think from my perspective, I think, you know, there's always room for new new, new ways of classifying things, new, new classifications at the same time the wheels of measuring the economy move very slowly. Um, it's diff you know, it's difficult to do, and it's difficult because fundamentally, because you know, government wants to know yes what's happening now, but they need to be able to benchmark for things like GDP, what's happening this year versus last year versus the year before versus the year before. So that's there's a reason, you know, that's one of the reasons why when changes come, they tend to be very very incremental. Um, and there's there's new rounds of decisions, for instance, around industry classifications or occupational classifications. Those are underway, I think, now for next year or possibly the year after. And that's kind of the time frame we talk about. There's international standards. There's lots of things. I think there, there's scope for this. And I think there's scope for new kind of experimental ways of doing this, which is a interesting area. Um, but it's the, the from the perspective of kind of how government actually measures the economy it tends to be very small c conservative because they need to because the the stakes of getting it wrong are very very high um and so it's it's tricky um i think so yes i think there's a role for it. there's other m ways of measuring things which we could talk about sort of in a separate conversation i'm happy to have sort of a separate chat about that um there's other ways that you can actually measure these things which you know there's other other approaches but it's 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 tricky and whilst i get frustrated sometimes i also understand that the people our colleagues at the office of national T statistics have a very 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 difficult job so i don't i don't wish to heap scorn on them because i wouldn't want to be in their shoes okay, thank you so I'm just trying to launch a little audience cam. I don't know if that's helped, so, so you can actually see the other people here. Um, okay, does anyone else have any any other questions at this point? We, I certainly have lots and lots. Um, yeah, I wanted to actually pick up on on something on one of Lara's points from her introduction, um, which links to what a bigger question anyway. You said you said you had a, a VC fund. I was wondering if you could explain what a VC fund is and how that how that links in with, with your other provision. 
So I'm not, I'm not aware of that abbreviation. Venture capital? Sure. So, so that's basically referring to the fact that we provide loans to small creative businesses who are looking to grow, essentially. So, um, and Josh will have as much no more knowledge than I do, although I've become very familiar with the literature. But essentially, some organizations, most organization, it would, most organizations, it would appear to be the case um, across the cultural sector and creative industries can struggle to access, this is my paraphrasing, struggle to access something larger than a grant and smaller than half a mil as one rough example. So institutional actors, lenders like the British Business Bank, for example, who have a set brief, which is about you know generating economic growth within the UK, that type of thing, have relatively agnostic financial products and services. The challenge of that is that creative industries activity and indeed the cultural sector, which are IP, intellectual property rich environments. So they make all kinds of things from gaming units, right the way through to plays. Um, and there is traditionally a huge struggle in sort of two aspects. One is securing funding to develop what's referred to as content. So ideas or information or, or, or material that is not a hard unit, basically. That's my lay, lay sort of description of that. The second element that's really difficult is, is that middle bit. So basically, if you want more than a grant, as in, you know, some early startups, for example, might be looking for one-off project-based funding that's looking to define an initial idea or a prototype. If they want to then commodify that into a larger structure to enter into a supply chain, to manufacture something, to grow that activity, they will struggle to access funding, including loans from high street banks, from other commercial investors, from private investors, um, and also definitely from institutional actors like the British Business Bank. So Creative UK, in, in one of its previous incarnations, saw that market failure, which is widely understood as a market failure, meaning you know the majority of activity in the cultural sector and creative industries lives in this middle space. This is where you get the brilliant, wonderful things that then convert you know, from a book to a play to a movie, that as one example. And pretty much across the board, those actors struggle to secure the kind of funding that they need to grow. So our VC fund specifically lends to those type of businesses and enters into a long-term partnership arrangement, which isn't just about handing cash over in a debt-based scenario, but also provides support for developing out their governance, their financial and business planning, the kind of acuity and, and sort of skills-based things that you really need to be successful in running a business of any kind anyhow. So that is what is unique about this fund that we have built. And it's specifically targeting this sort of mid-range area in which people systematically struggle to access finance. But I'm pretty sure Josh has a lot to add because I know he's an expert in this space. <laughs> um, no, I mean, I, I, I think I think that's a really good, um, really good explanation. And, you know, I, I think there is there are issues and, you know, Lars touch, touched on them, you know, in large part, you know, that that there, there are structural factors. So if you, you know, if you if you imagine that you have a bakery business, you know, and you make cakes and you you want to go to the bank and say, I currently make, you know, a thousand cakes a day. I want to make ten thousand cakes a day. Can I have a loan? The bank says, "Well, yeah. What do you know? What collateral do you have? To, you know, in case your business fails." And you say, "Well, we've got all of our ovens and all of our machinery and all of our other stuff. And so, if the business fails, you can you can have, you know, you can take that back." That's the way that the vast amount of financial financial systems work is on the basis of things like collateral. Thing is. If I go and I have a an idea for a book or a, you know a game, um, a video game, and I think I'm going to go and do this video game, well, what assets do I actually have? I've got the good idea. I might have character design. I might have some you know, I don't know level design. The people who know about gaming would probably know more about that. You don't. I mean, have some stuff, but that would be just bits on a computer. It doesn't necessarily have any intrinsic value to a bank to say, look, here's my thing. If my isn't you know if my business if my company fails look you can have this half finished game and it has value in the way that if my bakery were to fail they could go and they could take all the ovens and sell the ovens and get some of their money back and so this creates a lot of really interesting problems because as these as these companies um try to grow and try to exploit these assets the financial structures both from debt so from banks and also um, equity investors so when companies get a share of sell a share of their ownership to someone uh, which helps them to then then grow the business um, in both of those cases uh, the structures that are in place aren't necessarily always ideal 
And it's one of the things which is really interesting about the stuff historically um, and, and, and you know, today, uh, today that um, Creative UK has done in terms of trying to create new financial products, because um, using the example of venture capital, which is so if you're not familiar with venture capital, venture capital is it's a type of funding. Basically, every company that you know of that ends in dot com got its starting funding from venture capital. So, you know, Google, Apple, Microsoft, da, 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 all these companies got their start from venture capital. It's the main way that growing technology companies get their finance. But as I like to say, venture capital was, didn't just, wasn't just handed down on tablets from a mountain. Venture capital was invented by a bunch of people in America over about, you know, 25, 30 years ago. Uh, sorry, over a 25 to 30 year period from late 1940s into the mid 70s. It was invented and it evolved and it was an innovation at the time, it's been very successful at the same time for the creative industries, thinking about what the next steps are in terms of financing those, there's space for innovation in a similar way. But what it needs is it needs institutional actors like Creative UK, like various kind of industry specific groups who really know what's going on in their in their industries as well, to work together to be able to, to actually create these financial instruments that allow companies to grow and to get the capital they need, they might not be able to do otherwise. Well, thanks for that clarification, Josh. It's really helpful. We do have a question from the audience. Um, I guess you can wave at this, the audience can. Um, Hi, hello. Um, I'm new to the creative leaders who actually come here to the facilities and what are the funding opportunities funding opportunities. Um, I have an impression based on the presentations now that it look it sounds like the applicant is more likely to be a creative industry business. So I'm not quite clear how the academics can be involved in this application. Because you mentioned a lot about loan, the product, etc. It sounds like the niche initiation could be coming from a business. Yeah, so I don't think you guys both heard that okay. Um, so the question is, yeah, I guess, are, are you purely, well, I mean, Josh, you're in a, you, you are an academic, so you're in a kind of an interesting liminal space anyway, but um, Lara's uh, various schemes that she's involved with, they, they don't directly target ac academics or universities, is that right? But but you do sometimes work with universities in partnership with, uh, in fact, in fact, we've been involved in, in working with Creative UK, so we know that there are yeah. options. There. Um, so I didn't hear the question, but if it was about what relationship Creative UK has, for example, with academics and with universities, is that is that the question? Is that the yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Listen, the, the, uh, you guys were part of our membership structure until relatively recently, and no doubt you'll come back in and do course. We have something like eighty or ninety different FE and HEI providers in our structure. Universities and other educational structures care enormously about strong relationships, both with the cultural sector and industry at large. That's for a variety of reasons. You know, one of those is about uh, reform of cultural education as one specific example, which is in radically different states, um, depending on which part of the UK you look at, as well as looking to challenge that notion of how creativity is taught and or understood in different professional disciplines through the educational structures, whether that's primary and secondary right the way through to HEIs. And in fact, I'm sitting at the Royal Society here in London. I've just come out of a meeting where the primary discussion is about how we can work better together to influence the pipeline of who is coming through not just educational structures, but non-traditional approaches and how um, this quote unquote art v science divide is really not serving anyone in terms of how things are understood, either in policy mechanisms in systems and in funding, because actually what we need is, you know, for people to to be supported to understand and develop skills that are about, you know, critical thinking faculty and applying creative problem solving, and that those are relevant and meaningful approaches, regardless of your discipline, regardless of whether or not you end up in the cultural sector and creative industries. So that is just one example of how um, we work in deep partnership with further education and higher education institutions. And then, of course, there is the link into the job market. And of course, beyond that, you know, we're involved in the cluster based approach as well, co-locating academics. R&D approaches that include industry, the cultural sector, and advocacy groups as just one sort of sample of what exists in these cluster approaches is fundamentally important. And Creative UK and its sort of previous incarnations before it merged about a year and a half ago to this current structure was part of the inception approach that built, helped build the clusters. So um, we are deeply involved in academia. I just am centering on the finance conversation because that's what's coming through. And 
I think Josh and I share that view. So probably it's the richest bit that we can give you some perspective on in terms of what's acting as an active barrier um, to growth, both of individuals, the labor market at large, um, R&D overall, and definitely what comes through the pipeline in terms of academic growth at the other end, and indeed our soft and hard power globally. So there's like this continue, there's a chain of sort of issues that we've got that are systemic in nature um, and partnership work with academia and um, and educational institutions is absolutely fundamental to what we care about. And of course, we're um, supportive of PEC and, um, the, you know, the structure that Josh works in. And in fact, I think Hassan and I are getting ready to do some new cool things together as PEC builds itself out. And I've no doubt Josh and I are going to do something on finance too, I hope. Yeah. Yeah, yeah no, I, I, um, I uh, in, in, indeed, I uh, hope to uh, be involved in that. I think it sounds very exciting. So, um, I mean, I, I think the other, I think the other side of that question, in terms of of where funding sits for people who are in universities, and this is sort of with me taking off my sort of person who studies hat and putting on my person who's an academic hat. Um, I think there's there's a lot of there are are growing um growing there's a growing awareness of and availability of funding for researchers who are in the arts and humanities who are looking to do research and particularly who are interested in doing research that may have um commercial interest or or, or you know may I, I whether they're actually involved sort of studying as part of the creative industries or whether it's actually doing things that might be more um commercially or sort of you know business business facing developing new ideas and things like this and i think there, there, there's a range of opportunities there from obviously the very you know tip top end things like the creative industries clusters program which is a you know very very large kind of you know seven you know seven or eight figure level investment in particular clusters um all the way down to uh, a range of interventions that are available funded either by ahrc it's been very heartening to see the Innovate UK get involved in this space much more than they have in the past few years. So Innovate UK, which is sort of the UK's innovation funding agency, previously wasn't really sure what they were doing in the creative industry space. They've got much more active and uh, broad in terms of providing support to businesses and also funding collaborations with universities in the creative industry space. And so if you speak to your sort of colleagues at Brooks, or if you have questions, you can get in touch with me, but um, um, colleagues at Brooks, I'm sure would know all, all of this stuff just as well as I do. Um, you know, there's lots of, of opportunities for, you know, um, joint kind of innovation funding between academics and researchers. Uh, there are funding streams now for researchers in the social sciences and, and um, arts and humanities to work on academic spin-out projects and sort of boosting academic entrepreneurship. That's another uh, stream of funding that's available. Uh, and there, there's also, I mean, the, the line of research funding as well, which um, is typically comes under the AHRC banner. And there's a lot more funding in this space for academics in the various guises that they take on than there was, I mean, even, you know, five years ago. And I, I think that's part of the growing awareness of the importance of creative industries for the UK as a whole. Thanks, thanks. Any more questions from the room? Yes. I, I did. Um, I, I think so I, I may have the, the, the same questions for the both of them worded in slightly different ways, but but or maybe not, and they are both. But I was just wondering, um, first of all, Holden, which way around was it? Um uh, Laura, first of all, you mentioned that for the sorry, this is relating to the venture capital. You mentioned first of all that the the repayment system for creatives wasn't so simple um, as the kind of a, a debt repayment, but, but I, I, I wasn't sure what the, the alternative was there. And then perhaps that relates also, Josh, you were talking about how with the creatives, it's not so simple with the, the, the creative people might not have the, the collateral that you would if you're opening a, a cake shop. The, the, what is the, the collateral there? Is is there something that, that creative people would need to, to say, this is the thing that I'm putting up to, to kind of have a, a secured loan in, in that instance? How, how does it function in, in this kind of new world that's, that's being invented? Is that clear enough, guys? Did you hear that, those questions? So, Lara, yours, yours is about um, if the venture capital, uh, where, how is the debt repaid if it's not repaid in a traditional 
Um, so all that, is that right? I think that's what you said, yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, no, I didn't quite say that. What I was saying is that there's issues with access to finance generally. So there's issues with access to capital at very specific points in people's journey to try and grow activity. So the debt fund was created in response to that, to, to, to be able to at least extend loan-based approaches. You know, I mean, the, there is very, very little in the market at large for organizations like the ones that Josh and I are describing. So this specific fund was set up to at least extend what is already available to many other industries in relationship to how you grow a business, you know, and undertaking a debt-based approach, like, you know, getting a loan basically simply didn't exist, doesn't exist in, in most areas still. So the fund isn't unique in that respect. It's using a financial product and service that exists like everywhere else just wasn't necessarily accessible for this specific community. So that's, what's unique about the fund. There is very little that's like it. It's hard for for creative businesses of this specific size to grow, to to access any funding to grow, really, that's sustainable. So at least it locks them in for a period of time and gives them, you know, the security of three years of capital investment, that kind of thing. So sorry if I didn't communicate that very well. I know I tend to motor mouth because I'm quite excited about these subjects. So, yeah. That's great. Thank you. It's good, it's good to have the enthusiasm for venture capital. And the second it's, part it's a new thing for me, by the way. So please don't think that I'm like some age old finance hack. I'm, this is definitely, um, I've got, this is new, new for me. I think Josh knows, Josh has been in this game a lot longer than I ever probably knows a lot more about VC setups than uh, I do. Yeah. And the second part of the question was for, was for Josh. And that was about um, the problem of lack of collateral, I guess. Is there a solution to that when creating yeah. business seeking finance? Yeah. So, um, yes. I mean, I mean, I mean, so, so there are, I mean, obviously the, um, the, the debt program that um that um Laura's talking about that Creative UK have been involved in is one way to address that. And there there's an existing there's an existing format which is called um um venture debt, which is one way that companies are able to structure to be able to access debt that doesn't necessarily think about collateral in conventional ways. Because if you were to go going back to my previous example about a bakery, okay, if you know it's pretty easy to sell a it's pretty, you know, it's pretty easy to sell bake, bakery equipment if a company goes bust, right? You can take it, you can put it, stick it in an auction. It's pretty easy. At the same time, if you have more specialized assets, so imagine you've got a record label. If a record label goes bust, their underlying copyright assets may still have value, but you need to have the right people to be able to actually understand what to do with those assets if the company fails. And so, I think so. That's one of the things which I think the, 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 this um um. The, this uh, debt program is really valuable in. But the other thing which often happens, and this is where the creative industries gets kind of interesting, and, and it comes to the broader issue. The issue with debt is not distinctive. The, the issue with collateral is not distinctive to the creative industries. And that's how the venture capital format was created in the first instance, because people back in Silicon Valley had these really good ideas for how to make microchips and make microchips better. They didn't actually have any money. They didn't actually have much in the way of collateral. And they came up with an idea of saying that instead of actually having a collateral system, which is where you get a loan and you pay back the loan plus interest, that I go to a company that if, if I'm if I'm an investor, I go to a company and say, I will buy 20% of your company or whatever. And I will then help you to grow, but then I will own a share of that company and will then have 20% of all of the profits and all of the growth that comes from that company if you continue to grow and grow and grow and become successful. And so there were lots of investors who got in at the early stage of Intel and Google and you know name, name your company and made loads and loads and loads of money that way because they got in at the early stages and bought a share of the company. The problem is that Creative industries sometimes can can fall between the two stools there. So, the VC sector is very is is very strong, is very organized. Sometimes doesn't completely understand the business models of how creative industries businesses work. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. It depends on the sector and the business and things like this. It also it comes into funding um, repayment horizons and stuff like this. But it tends to sort of sit between two stools, and so. The, this this opportunity for sort of new new financial instruments and things like this is a way to sort of bridge some of these gaps that exist in this space and come up with new ways of being able to uh, support these businesses and helping these businesses to be able to to ultimately become successful. Yeah, I know. I, I know that we're talking about this within the, the context of the, the creative industries, which perhaps do link 
quite um, in some instances to, to business and, and enterprise. I'm going to ask that around for a lot of the time, although it can work to a business model, that, that kind of, that, that's hidden behind the, the individual and the artist. And I'm just trying to think about how these two worlds kind of relate to, to each other. Yeah. But actually, you've got me thinking more about the the um the structure of the that Sarchi took on, of course, when he's promoting artists, but then taking on some of their paintings almost as payment and then promoting them. So yeah, it's almost kind of I don't know, done it in a different way. Yeah. But, yeah. Thank you. Sorry. If I if I can just chip in on that. Um I think I think that's I, th I think what you indicate there is also a really important characteristic of the creative industries, which often sort of doesn't show up in classic financial considerations, which is the fact that creative industries are much more likely to rely on a freelance workforce, very likely to involve mm -hmm. individual you know individual creators who are working on their own or you know in in networks on individual projects, and that's a very difficult model to be able one to finance but two to be able to sort of figure out ways of growing because you know from your experience if you if your background is in art and if you're an artist how far do you want your business to grow your, your business if you're prepared to see your art as a business which it's entirely legitimate for you not to do because you see it as art but at the same time if you're wanting to feed yourself and have that be your primary job then what do you do in that how do you treat yourself do you see yourself as an entrepreneur in terms of how you see yourself is that actually an identity that you're prepared to take on and more sort of so thinking about all of those issues at the individual level. And that ends up becoming sort of a whole other interesting layer of this. And I think one of the really interesting things which um, has existed in, you know, I think Creative UK has done space in this and lots of other, you know, uh, places as well is providing support for individuals to gain the skills to be able to learn about this stuff and say, actually, you know what, I'm not interested in growth capital, or maybe I am trying to find out exactly what where it is they want to go on that. And so I think that thing about the individual level is really is really important. It's another sort of unique characteristic of creative industries as opposed possibly just to other sectors. Thank you. We do have a probably a final question from the audience as we're running out of time. So my question again is very amazing. Um, I have reflected from other displays, but not this world, not, not this area. I think that because the business in the sector is very small, so I'm interested in what kind of research impact okay, uh, are, are the funding body looking for because of the, the business is very small, individuals, entrepreneurs, and the impact to be very tiny. So what, how can we upscale to make the research more impactful? That's a good question. Such a good question. Well, I can answer that as a non-academic, um, uh, which I hope is a valuable perspective still to hear from. So as someone who's been primarily concerned in relationship to academia with commissioning and working in partnership to either undertake new primary research or secondary analysis and then port that into policymaking conversations. So for me, I think one of the biggest considerations is how translatable that research is uh, with relationship to the current context. So how relevant is it for the debate and issues that are occurring right now. Um, and that's probably not a very sexy thing to say, but that is the reality of, of what will be more impactful. So, you know, if you are able to link current contextual issues and you have a deep understanding or you at least seek to sort of build in partnership um, access to the kind of insights that will tell you what's happening in industry, in advocacy groups, you know, um, in, in terms of officials perspective within the civil service and various governments, that kind of thing, you are more likely to design research that is going to land when it comes out the other side, no matter how short or long term that is. So that would be my biggest hint and tip. So I think part of that is, you know, someone like Josh gets a leg in a bunch of different worlds, don't you, Josh? So the ability to sort of funnel that insight into how you inform your research questions and what you're thinking about, I would argue is critical as a research professional, because at the end of the day, I presume um, that most of you share the same passion I do for making change. That is, you know, whether or not that's about undertaking new evidence gathering or generating insight, ultimately we want that to land. <laughs> we want that to land with people who have the ability to, to, to take decisions that affect our lives. So for me, that's probably the standout kind of um, thing I would encourage you to think about. I'm so sorry, I have to disappear because I'm going to get kicked out of my meeting room in exactly one minute. I'm so sorry. Thank you so much for joining us, Laurie. You've been brilliant. Thank you so much. Oh, it's been wonderful being here. Thank you so much for inviting me. And I look forward to connecting um, in any other way that's useful to you guys. Thank you very much.
Uh, Josh, do you have anything to say about Im impact? That's a huge topic to end on, I know, but... Um... Um, I mean, likewise, that could also be another hour. Um, yeah. I'll, um, I'll, I'll, I'll try to... Um, I mean, basically, I completely agree with everything Laura said. I mean, one of the things I've learned from my time working with the Creative Peck is that we, uh, so, so we as academics tend to think that, you know, we tend to, you know, think about what's been written in the academic literature in a particular subfield, and you manage to make an incremental increase enough to get it past your journal editors, or, you know, get it into a book, and then you've got it, and then you say, okay, fantastic, hey world, here's this thing I've done, let me, and then you move on to the next thing. And the thing that I've, I think the two things I've learned from my experience in this is, one, it's really important to know what is actually valuable because a lot of the debates that are around in academia have zero relevance to policymakers. And if you talk to practitioners or policymakers, anything like that, they'll just be like, yeah, I, I don't know what that is and I'm not interested. You know, Sorry, sounds cool, good luck, not interested. And so engaging with practitioners um, and policymakers to find out what is interesting is really really important so that that's the first thing i would say and you know laura said that more eloquently than i could uh the other thing i would say which i've definitely learned is that we as academics tend to as i said before you tend to write something get it published and then move on to the next thing and then not talk about the thing you did before because that's the old thing now you're working on the new thing and one of the things i've learned is just because something is new to you and something is out in the world doesn't mean that everyone knows about it or cares about it. And there's a lot of selling that we as academics can do of our work, taking the same message and selling it again and again and again and again and again. And over the period of COVID, we put out our first creative radar report, which was talking about creative microclusters. And I probably gave the exact same talk probably 10 or 15 times over a year. Um, to different audiences, trying to explain what we were doing, what we were trying to achieve with that research, and that ended up becoming some of our really high impact um, um, research. But that was because we kept pushing it again and again and again and again and again. And so that I think is part, I mean, it's not exactly the question you were asking, but I think it's, you know, how do you actually turn something from sort of small impact to big impact? Part of it is sort of, rather than having a lot of small things that do small impacts, it may be having one thing that you reckon is the most impactful thing you've done and really selling that and continuing to sell it on an ongoing basis. And that combined with having something which is actually relevant that people care about, that's a much better way from my perspective of generating stuff that um, has a chance of actually cutting through and, and making a difference. Can I answer that? Sure, yeah. This is, this is exactly the same in, in science as well. Um, it's not that different at all from your, because the, the promotion and self uh, representation is is such an uh, important aspect of all uh, our you know, work, uh, and therefore it makes it very important to to bring this across. That impact, wherever it comes from, is important to be able to represent it, and we often be able to demonstrate that to external because that's the only thing that makes the work distinct from all the other pieces that have been published. Thank you. Great, I guess we'll end by now. Thank you very much to my audience for fantastic questions. Um, I'm sorry about the problems of translation between screen and room, it always happens. But I think um, our, our contributors were, were also excellent. It's a shame Laura had to nip off, but thank you so much, Josh. It was really useful. And we'd love to work with you again on, on whatever you've got coming up. Yeah, um, fantastic. Yeah, that sounds great. Just like, so let's give Josh a round of applause. Okay. Thanks, for, thanks very much for having me. It's been a been been really interesting, really interesting conversation, and yeah, very happy to to keep in touch. Yeah, thank you.